Hey everybody, welcome to the Early Days Podcast. Hey, I'm Marin. I'm Julian. Uh, this is the show where we talk with fellow entrepreneurs about their experience of building businesses, the ups and downs, the success, the failures, all the lessons and challenges that they're having. Uh, and on today's episode, we had Karim Mustafa from... From Tribe Tactics, yes, right? Yes, very good. A very interesting business which is based around creating a lot of content for people in a very time-efficient way. Uh, so the, the slogan is kind of one, one hour of your time for one month of content. I think the importance of content is becoming more and more prominent. Uh, so it's a very interesting business model and a very, very cool guy that's building uh, something with his brother. And so it was a kind of a two dual people dynamic. Yeah. Um, Some very nice resources um, and uh, kind of general thoughts about how you should run a business when you're just starting out. A lot of thoughts about content creation, content uh, production, uh, communication, how you can outsource this if you are uh, don't have the time and you are pressed... Uh, uh, by time uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of other bits and pieces I think that uh, could be very helpful for you if you're in your early days and it's a fascinating conversation uh, you can uh, find out more about them in the show notes in the comments and until next time enjoy the show okay Karim welcome uh, to, to the to the podcast can you please give us a quick introduction about yourself and what you're currently working on yeah, guys. So thanks so much for, for having me on the show. Uh, yeah, so my name is Karim uh, and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Tribe Tactics. And basically we are a subscription box service um, for brands that don't have time to create their own content. We take one hour of their time and we turn it into a month of content across um, video, audio, written and image. Uh, similar to like all these like influencer style content that you see around. Uh, we, you know, we... Uh, we do something very similar to that. Can you go a little bit into detail about how this works? Because before our conversation, I checked the, the platform itself. Uh, and uh, I got intrigued. You say one hour of my time, basically, and then you make all this content for a month. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like a very uh, very big promise uh, very to sure. make. Can mm -hmm. you go into the agree. detail of how this works? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, um, it's, it's actually very interesting and it's not something that we invented. It's just something that we, uh, we were inspired by and we studied and we've seen a lot of great people do it. Uh, and we just took the steps to reverse engineer what they've been uh, doing work. So uh, it's no surprise. This uh, all started with um, Gary Vee uh, and his great team at VaynerMedia. Um, you know, very busy executive, uh, and yet he's uh, always able to create a lot of amazing content and video, audio written. How does he do that? Um, and of course, as, as many of us know, there's obviously a great team behind that. And they've actually published an amazing resource, which I strongly recommend to anybody who wants to do something similar, uh, called the Gary V Content Model. Uh, you can Google it and you can find it. It's completely there for free. Uh, essentially, the idea behind it is to come up with a, um, a pillar piece of content uh, this could be a, um, a video show, for example, like the one we're doing right now, or at the very least an audio show, but it, you need to choose one of these like core formats, either video or audio, because based on that, you can take like a 20, 30 minute episode. And from there, you can take the parts that you really like, the highlights, for example, and you can chop those up into smaller uh, micro content pieces, as they are called. Um, and then you can just do the transcriptions and the subtitling for those. Uh, which is great because if it's less than 60 seconds, that is great for Instagram. People don't really listen to audio that much on Instagram. Same on Facebook as well these days when they're commuting, things like that. Uh, but of course, you also have the audio on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud. Um, and so uh, what else? And so, you know, uh, something that really stood out to us maybe in a particular video show, we can take that and turn it into a poster quote, right? And we repurpose that for different social channels. Uh, we can even listen to all the conversations that took place in a particular video episode and rewrite that in the first person as if the host of the show uh, decided to write that article. So before you know it, you have all these pieces of content, even though uh, from the, you know, from, from, from the brand's perspective, it only took them that much, uh, that much time. And I really encourage a lot of people to just do this by themselves. It's actually um, quite simple to, uh, to, to explain, to get started, I guess. Uh, I suppose where we hopefully add value is for people that uh, they realize that it's going to take them a lot of time to actually do this in-house. They'll be able to leverage our team, our process, our technology. That's a lot of media production, uh, and uh, I assume it goes. It's a it's a very uh, extensive uh, process as well to go through all the content and make all the separate 
pieces? Do you do it just yourself and your brother, which we saw earlier, or is it? Do you have a team of people? Do you work with freelancers? Explain a little bit about the behind the scenes of how things get made. Yeah, of course. So right now, uh, you know, we uh, so it's it's myself and my uh, brother, and we also work with uh, different members of the team, and we have different arrangements with them based based on their expertise, based on the the frequency and the cadence of of the work that we get and and how how much we rely on them. Uh, but that's you know that that's ultimately it, and essentially it it, it really does come down to because uh, as you said, like it, it 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 is it's a ton of stuff to do, and it really does come down to just um, proper like project management, and we're very hard on ourselves when it comes to project management. Um, like every couple of weeks, we uh, come up with something new that makes all of what we've been working on so far like completely. Uh, useless pretty much or like obsolete like because we found like such like we realized we were so stupid there's such a there's a much more efficient way to do this so on and so forth so especially in the early days like that's uh one thing that you realize time and time again that you're always uh trying to outdo yourself from two weeks ago you're always competing with yourself like two weeks ago uh and trying to to improve those processes because if you think about it anything that you're going to be doing more than once once you have a process or a standard operating procedure behind it you'll be able to streamline it and put the right people in the right seats. How do you find out that it's time to change and to switch to uh, to, to do something new, to do something fresh? Yeah, so um, I think it, you know, it, it's always driven by our mission that we, we really want to uh, make it as simple as, you know, having it just a one hour of investment into a month of content. How do we continue to strive on that and even over deliver on that? And, it, and based on this vision or overall, uh, yeah, based on overall this overall vision, we see how can we actually operationalize that and where are the current bottlenecks in our processes right now? What are the things that are taking the most time? How do we actually prioritize that based, and we quantify it based on the business impact. And then based on that, we decide what we'd like to fix first, because there's always stuff to, to be fixed. Uh, but I guess that's just how we prioritize it. And just to, before we go forward, I want to take a step back and you mentioned kind of how the idea came about, mm -hmm. but what made you actually commit to it? Like, why did you think that it's, it's a project that you guys want to tackle full time and kind of how did you approach, you know, that step from the idea to actually committing to it? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Julian. Like, um, okay, so, so our background is, uh, I used to work with HubSpot as a marketing consultant uh, for, for a lot of great agencies that were part of the partner program. Uh, and with uh, with them and my brother, he used to do something similar, but in, uh, in Google. And so we realized, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you you know, time and time again, one of the the pain points that we kept seeing in general, and it's it's no it's no surprise is is that uh, people always think of their own content at the very end. Uh, nobody has time to do their own content, uh, and you know, sometimes it, it it's not as simple as just outsourcing it or something like that because no one can quite capture the ideas that. That you have in your mind, but you don't have time to do it. So you have this catch twenty two going on, and you know we've done some research on this, and we uh, decided to to honestly just go for the for the plunge uh, because, as anyone who is and, and you guys definitely have experience with this as well, but anyone in a similar position will realize that there's nothing quite like working full time on something, uh, even if there are some days where you, where you would work full time on something. Um, you know, you, you would realize how much more you get done. And we realized that fundamentally, like, this cannot be like a side project for us. We really need to go all in um, and, and see where that takes us, you know. How many hours do you spend per day? Uh, I don't think it's in the legal amount. I think it's, uh, <laughs> bit, I think it's, uh, it's be better not to say because I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a nice number. Too early, finish, start too early and, and finish too late. So anywhere but anywhere from, so to give you an idea, like when, when we have a lazy start, we start at like 7 a.m. That's like, like we need to get better at this kind of thing. Uh, and then we finish, uh, sometimes it's, it goes into like 8 p.m., 9 p.m., uh, right. 10 p.m. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine like running your own business is definitely something that, but it, at one point it doesn't feel like work as well, I think. so. Exactly. And you've just hit the nail on the head. Like ultimately we, you know, when you see us at the end of the day where we, we are tired, but at the same time where you, like we still have energy where we're, because we've been working on something that we really believe in and we're um, helping people on the way as well. So it's very motivating for us, I guess. 
Yeah. When well, you mentioned helping people, how do you manage the relationship with your clients? Uh, because you touched on that already. Uh, sometimes you're missing the context. And we've noticed that as well when we're working. We did some uh, projects with uh, student groups from universities. Mm -hmm. uh, here we also worked with a few freelancers uh, over the past two years. Um, and even though like we meet on a regular basis, we're super open. We share everything that uh, we can possibly share. There's a lot of context and just communication that's happening between us two that is left out for the people who is trying to who are trying to help us. Um, so I can imagine if a client comes in and they do this one hour with you, um, eventually when you create all the content, there could be the the possibility that it's not exactly how turn, it doesn't turn out as good as or as it doesn't mm -hmm. convey the message they expect to convey. How do you go around managing this with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first of all, we uh, so that that's a really good point and. Uh, you know, I, I think when you're able to acknowledge something before it actually happens and just being realistic that there's going to be different like uh, drafts and different revisions and things like that. When you know that ahead of time, you can already uh, prepare for it and, and, and plan the process accordingly. Uh, so we use Slack very often. Uh, we use a lot of other um, technology tools that help us uh, with like feedback gathering and, and, and um, like collaboration tools in general. Can you mention some of those? Because they could be useful for some of the people. Who yeah, of course. So we use, um, so one of our favorite ones is a tool called frame.io. And it's basically like Google Docs, but for video. So you and me can be uh, editing this video, for example, and we can we can both see very clearly like what we're talking about. Uh, it's not something that's abstract. We're all talking about the same thing, leaving comments on the same, uh, on the same tool. Uh, that's in terms of video. I, I strongly recommend that tool. It's one that we use all the time. Um, but really, it's it's just about building, uh, setting the right expectations with uh, with clients. That hey, guys, like uh, we can only get to the end goal with with your help because ultimately this is something uh, for you guys to sell to tell your own to tell your own story. And so we're going to have almost like different checkpoints throughout the process where we're going to pause. We're going to get together. We're going to review this. And after one, let's say, block of work is done, then we'll move on to the next block, uh, so on and so forth. And I feel like. When when people take the time to set expectations ahead of time, it's uh, I think it's like one of the one of the best things you can do because the opposite would be like obviously over promising and saying oh it's going to be perfect you just sit back and relax. Uh, we're very open about our process. We're very open about how you know we're an early stage startup um, and, and 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 that we're always like in this constant like beta phase. So uh, so that's <laughs> that's how we've been getting on so far. How do you, you mentioned one, one month of content, do you deliver that at once at the end of the month or is it kind of a weekly thing? And I guess you kind of deliver a big file with all the, with all the assets and they, then they take care of posting it. Yeah, so we deliver different things um, at, at different times. Um, usually it would, it would start with the, with, the full, with the full episode uh, because everything else comes from that, that, uh, that big episode. We, uh, we're trying to get better at our analogies of how we explain what we do. Um, but we have one which is uh, unfortunately not not very vegetarian friendly, but it's essentially kind of like having, uh, let's say, um, a cow, for example, and from the one cow you can get your your burgers, your brisket, your uh, your sausage, your steak. But we need to get the cow first. You know what I mean? And so this is essentially like very very similar to the to the process that we follow, I guess. I promise we'll find a better uh, a better analogy with time. Thanks for the warning, though. Appreciate the content. <laughs> I've got uh, your slogan. About uh, so you you mentioned kind of the the pillar content being a, whether it's a video or a show or a podcast. How do you uh, ge geographically speaking? How do you manage that? So let's say there's a client from uh, let's say Amsterdam. Do you do a call like mm -hmm. this? over the kind of over hangouts and they record that and split that up or is it kind of they need to travel or you need to travel or you send guys mm -hmm. yeah so it's um it's you know it's it's very uh it varies you know like first of all what what we always look at is uh, coming up with a strategy for a uh, for a show um because all of us uh, you know are naturally in this mindset of hey let's create some content that will you know, in a way, like promote our products and services. And there's obviously nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's just a lot of that. And so we like to think, and again, this is not our idea. It's just something that we noticed. I guess one of our strengths is we're just good at noticing stuff that other people do. Uh, but basically, you know, we, we've seen that the people who go for it, the people who don't necessarily market a product or service, but market a specific culture around that. Um, and what that means is essentially modeling as a uh, modeling or, 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 
or, or marketing around uh, the specific um, worldviews, the specific ideas, the specific um, behaviors around uh, a certain culture. And you can decide what culture means. A culture could be a specific um, set of audience in a particular industry. Um, it could be uh, you know, people who use a certain technology and they have a certain set of dreams and, and fears. And based on that, you can create a show that essentially connects those people. So you're almost like being the voice of that. So to get back to the point, essentially the first thing that we do is we help them come up with a concept for a show, a YouTube show. And so whether they uh, decide to do that um, over over like you know Hangouts or Skype like this, for example, or whether they would like to do it um, at their own premises and kind of do it like as an interview talk show, or whether it's actually a live event, for example, like a fireside chat or something like that, it really is up to them. I feel like we mainly come in uh, once the footage is there, uh, unless we're called to do the actual professional videography as well. That's that's something else as well. Yeah. I would love to go a little bit more detail into the process of starting the company. Uh, sure. You mentioned already several times you work with your brother on this. Uh, was it the intention from the very beginning to work with a co-founder? What's your experience working with a co-founder, especially a co-founder who is a family member as well? Can you talk us through that, the, the yeah. positive sides, the challenges of uh, doing that, and eventually how do you find the best way to work together? I think uh, the reason why is because I, I think he's the only one who said yes to me. Uh, but but I think as well, like at the very start, we we almost had like this SLA or this like agreement where we say, uh, you know, everything we approach, we're going to approach it very objectively. Everyone's going to have their own, um, you know, their own set of responsibilities, their own set of people that they work with, so on and so forth. Um, you know, we we have certain ways of of holding each other accountable. They're tied to specific KPIs and specific deliverables. Uh, and because no one is reporting to no one is reporting to the other, um, you know, we we kind of uh, consult with each other, but we also take each other's um, advice, but we also give each other advice. And you know, we we just as long as we're keeping it objective, I think that's that's where we're most productive and most effective. And how are you guys? Because I know you you're bootstrapping and working on that full time. Without you don't have to give away any numbers, but how are you thinking about? funding it uh, bootstrapping like have you have you given yourself let's say a runway are you looking for investment down the road how are you thinking monetizing you know how are you how are you thinking about the whole financing yeah so that's a that's a really good point um so we originally came into this honestly just with our own savings um and uh just our, our own savings and just not not being fancy so like all the stuff that we enjoy to do, you know, eating out, doing all this stuff, we've cut that down uh, ridiculously. We've figured, we didn't, we've done the math and we realized that, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, if we're able to, uh, I don't know what's the correct way to describe this, but like if if we're able to reduce our our lifestyle in a way, we'll be able to generate more runway. Um, so that's that was one funding source. Obviously, obviously revenue uh, from clients is another source, but really it's just about. I, I believe anyone can start. Uh, where they are, um, and we've ac I've actually written a uh, a blog post about this recently, of this idea that you know if you're especially if you're already in a job, a lot of people would try and give good advice, and and it is good advice for many that like hey maybe now's not the right time, why don't you save a little bit more money, or now's the not not the right time, you know you might you may be getting a promotion soon or something like that, and that's completely fine of course if this is what that person's goal is. Uh, but ultimately, what we've realized, uh, and we've worked for like two corporates, you know, so we realized that no matter how much you quote unquote learn uh, and, and and quote unquote experience, once you start to do your own thing full time, not not like weekends, full time, you realize like shit, like this is the whole other world, and there's so much stuff that I, I I wasn't faced with until I actually started to to do this. Um, it's very lonely. It's very scary but it's also one of the most rewarding things that you'll ever do one of the most um uh educational things that you that you'll do because you're not just learning how to build a business but you're also uh you're adding value to others obviously which is great but you're also learning all these things that people don't talk about you learn about like discipline you learn about gratitude for all the uh, the free food you used to get from your companies and and, and stuff like that that's applicable um but yeah, you learn you learn about yeah you learn about being um, uh, you know f following a process and sticking to it because you have no other choice. It's not like it's not like oh yeah well I'll, I'll just you know I have my job anyway. No, this is the job. You know what I mean? 
especially when there's other people depending on you a lot of this stuff like kind of like wakes you up and it, and it helps you to really focus on on the here and now to focus on where you are and where what what step you need to take um to do the other thing what's the biggest lesson that you've learned since you started then uh the importance of um understanding that everything is uh, your fault at the end of the day so everything is my fault and my and my co-founder's fault anytime we come across a hiccup or anything that doesn't go well and this this uh you know th these are things that uh, are are inevitable it's not a it's not a matter of if but a matter of when um you know we can uh you know point fingers and come up with excuses and things like that and even if those excuses are you know so-called valid one of the most uh i think just um, useful things to do is to recognize that or just get into the mindset of saying that hey everything is ultimately our fault because this is actually relieving in a way because now that we know it's our fault we also know that we have um, the opportunity to be able to fix that into the future whether it means uh, revisiting our processes or whether it means that we need to start to uh, just adopt different mindsets towards different things so on and so forth yeah and to follow up on that what's the kind of the biggest challenge you're, you're having right now so it could be both business or personally related to the business and running that you know having the pressure of, of building it yeah just anything that you find kind of the, the biggest challenge my challenge is finding the number one thing there's obviously a lot of challenges i'm trying to think of one that could be um that maybe could be relatable or the first thing that comes to mind the first thing that comes to mind uh you know well uh first thing that comes to mind well, we have a dream to, to, to get a mortgage for a house, to be honest, and uh, this is 100% dependent on the success of what we're working on. Uh, and if that's not a motivation, I don't know what is, you know, in my, in my case. You know. It's very true. I think because we've kind of put ourselves into, yeah, I mean, we are building a business, but it's a kind of a more pressure-less, if there's a word like that approach and i think that sometimes we kind of lack the the sharpness to do stuff like there's no pressure and timelines pushing us to do that so i see you know the benefits of your approach and i see the benefits of our approach but i think of course the the day, whatever works for us for us and for you is the is the is the benefits of it's a limited runway as well and it kind of it all depends on you like you said you have that uh, that those goals in mind so you need to kind of make it work otherwise you know i mean you can always go back to the job but you know it's it's uh it's nice to to have some pressure uh yeah and i, and I think it's um you know and, and and you know you guys have a lot of experience in this which is why I'm, I'm really glad to be talking to you today but i think it really does come down to to you just knowing yourself and uh, just understanding what what your you know what your working style is um uh, and you know i think in 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 the world that we live in right now the the good news is that there is a lot of opportunities for people to to raise money uh not just through accelerators and vcs uh in past projects i've tried to raise uh money from uh from like accelerators vcs and i was shut down completely uh, i think i'm really bad at that uh which was a blessing in disguise because it forced you to sell your product so that you can make money that way you know so i think it's it, it just really comes down to knowing yourself and knowing what you're good at and just you know um focusing on that but one thing that i've uh, that i've learned like just firsthand is the fact that there's nothing that there are some things that you genuinely won't learn on the job until you actually start to do something full time uh, just because of all the the i guess just the overall atmosphere around it yeah for sure i can testify to that i think once you start doing something that you're personally invested in and so you have all the pressure and you're responsible for all the sense that you all the sense that you need to mm -hmm. spend yeah you look at totally different level i used to have a marketing job uh, for quite some time learned a lot i really liked it like my the people i like i work with the colleagues uh, the the work the, the product uh, itself great company mm -hmm. everything. and i was doing all these very interesting and exciting things and then once we started actually implementing marketing tactics here uh to try to grow Dulo and to to build it into this brand that we want to build it in yes i realized how many how much of the things I don't really know, uh, or either because they were outsourced to somebody uh, before when we had no resources, or just mm -hmm. going to really deep, very emotional level where you really care about something, you go through yeah. every detail and you double check it. 
And that kind of leads me to asking you, how do you guys think about the speed, action, and all that? Something that Gary Vee talks a lot about, especially mm. in the line of business with clients who uh, might be very picky about certain things. How do you think about that? So around, uh, so you're saying speed versus perfection, right? In terms yeah. of, yeah. So honestly, sometimes you just, uh, you know, you need to crank out a lot of uh, material, and it might not be ninety. 99% or it might be 95%. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe the, those five is what the client is really cares about, but you know, you have to convince them that the audience doesn't really care or see that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think you, you've provided the, the answer there because I, I you know, it, it really does come down to, you know, the, 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 I mean, pick your favorite quote, but there's, there's a lot of, there's a big school of thought of, you know, thinking of people that, uh, that say, you know, uh, done is better than perfect. I think it's something like that. It's the overarching theme. Because once you actually have stuff out there, you'll be able to gauge interest. And that's why there's a lot of support for, you know, even when building startups to think of, um, thinking of, a, of the startup as, for example, not just building like a Ferrari from day one, um, but rather building, for example, a scooter at the very start and then building, you know, like a motorbike and then building uh, maybe like a small car and then like a supercar. Um, and so essentially that's the idea behind it. Uh, you always want to be in, in constant momentum and always look to get better with every with every time you ship. Because I think, the, and I'm just speaking to, like, I know that this is something that we always say internally as well. Um, the worst thing you can do is debate something with all your team uh, on what's the best thing to do and to waste so much time uh, when you could have just launched it to the market and found out for sure. Because the market always, the market never really cares uh, uh, who those people are they just they or in other words the market is always very objective so the fastest way for us to actually accelerate learning is to put something out there um, and a, a bonus here is that sometimes things that are not absolutely perfect are uh, sometimes more relatable to and this is why you see some big uh, big companies uh, without mentioning any names that are having great success recording for example selfie videos when they can very easily afford like a professional videography team or whatever, uh, but they purposely do that. I don't want to use the word strategy because that like ruins everything. But like the, just this idea of them getting getting uh, getting with the culture and and saying, hey, like we're just like you, we're sharing content just like you. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to that. And how are you guys thinking about your own content strategy? So how are you uh, marketing, mm -hmm. going, you know, spreading the word about about the business? Yeah, so of course, the only way to prove that this works is to take a bit of our own medicine. So we have our own podcast show. Uh, love to have you guys on it when you're in Dublin next. Um, we call it the uh, the Spare Room Talks, and it's essentially a show where we like to interview people uh, that have achieved uh, certain levels of um, success or milestones and to get very, very tactical on how they manage to approach those. And then we would record the full episode. We do all the micro content videos. We put it up on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud. We'd write an article about it. Any quotes that we like from them, especially, we would send those as images. And before we know it, we have like a, a month of content as well. But in addition to that, we're also like trying to do just like standalone, uh, just quick, quick standalone videos, which which we don't need to transcribe. Um, but you know, there are uh, there's okay. There's one more thing that we're actually doing right now, which is. Um, for me, for example, it's my job to, to create content uh, at the moment for the company. And so uh, one of the things that does not come naturally to me is recording video. Um, a lot of people reach out and, uh, and talk to us about video and things like that. But the truth is I need to do a ton of prep before I can actually get on video uh, because I'm, I'm actually a writer by, by, by nature. And so I've actually reversed the process for myself by, you know, step one, writing an article first, uh, step two, recording myself reading the article so it's kind of like a kind of like a mini i don't know audio i don't say audio book but like a mini audio clip that could work for that and then number three now that it's still fresh in my head i would record a video about what i just wrote because it's just like three four minutes about something that i already wrote and i would still be able to get the three pieces of content from them so we're trying to experiment with like you know multiple different uh, things at the same time and anything that we see like consistency with or, or positive trends with we try and see, right, how can we productize that and add it to, to what we're currently offering as well. 
how do you maximize or how do you uh, utilize this content to attract your uh, customers uh, basically and maybe you can start even further uh, like a little bit before mm -hmm. that how did you attract your very first customers yeah okay so that's an excellent uh an excellent question and it's also the million dollar question right so ultimately um th there's a so there's a book that i came across very recently by um uh oh my god i just want to check the name quickly no worries. But yeah so it's uh yeah daniel uh daniel priestley and he is a uh, very successful um, entrepreneur, business owner, and uh, and best-selling author. Uh, he's also he's very known for a specific for for many books, but the one that I that I am reading right now is called Oversubscribed, um, and it's an excellent book. And he talks about there's part of it there's a part in it where he talks about all the number of touch points that somebody needs to have before they um, not only I'm paraphrasing here, but not only know you but also trust you and and like you as well, and so. You know, adopting that approach, we just try and put out as much content as possible. We don't worry too much about likes and engagement. That's obviously a, a, a good a good positive signal. But we just want to make sure that we've put the content out there and that people are generally seeing it. For example, we see reactions sometimes in the form of, um, you know, private, uh, you know, like private DMs or whatever. Um, so it really does come down to just putting out putting out as much content as possible because, especially if it's so, if I'm thinking of Doodle right now, like. The fact that you guys are documenting your journey is absolutely amazing because they're not just seeing, um, you know, excuse my French, they're not just seeing like a, a general brand, but they're actually seeing the people behind the brand as well. So the more that people can do that, the more it's going to come, it's going to be top of mind for them because they may not buy necessarily, but when a friend of theirs asks for something, they will have an interesting story to tell thanks to the content that you've provided. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, when, when we started, I think we, because uh, previous to launching, we actually did one year of product development. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we were documenting quite a lot of the process. So we found out that the first... I, I read that on your blog, actually. Yeah, so it was nice basically to not launch, you know, in front of cricket. So we had kind of a small audience. And from that small audience, you know, the, the first customers came. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saw a lot of benefit from that. And then kind of after that process, it kind of dropped down because it was the... I mean, the people that were waiting for the product got the product. And then it was... It, we saw this organic, like nearly a flat line, but then maybe after one, it kind of clicks. And, you know, you see a DSEO kind of picks up because you just spread out mm -hmm. some of the content and you don't know, you know, from where people might come. So yeah. it, uh, it's kind of yeah, just, you know, throwing stuff in the water. But then at some point it, that, you know, accumulates and, and you see the results. But it, it is a long term uh, thing, but I think it, it, it really makes sense to do it. Especially when, when you're creating content with the people that, uh you know, that, that this product is for essentially. Uh, this is a great way to be able to to share to share that value adding content with other people like them as well, because they're already featured in that content, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the fact that, for example, you guys are interviewing uh, entrepreneurs like predominantly on, on the show, if I understood correctly, uh, is, is I think great because uh, this is this is like one of the core markets for for a, for a product like that. So, you know, it really is about this kind of like collaboration and co-creation piece. Um, a lot of us have discovered our favorite artists, maybe because they have already featured in a different track or something like that. And these guys could have run all sorts of ads, you know, uh, targeted, whatever, but it's still cold. Uh, however, maybe just featuring on an album or going to basically going where the attention is and, and building credibility by association. This way, they're able to fast track their recognition and fast track their uh, you know their their trust and 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 therefore therefore like referrals and sales and things like that. Yeah, and I think something that we've noticed uh, from the podcast because we mainly I mean percentage wise is mostly people from the US, and mm -hmm. I think the US in general is is very good at that. You know, there's a lot of collaboration partnerships, and I think it's something that we lack in Europe, and it's uh, something to keep in mind. You know, we it's we need to use that tool as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. We we you know we 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 always learn a lot from like because uh, we're big fans of like hip hop and stuff. Are you guys fans of hip hop as well? We I follow it. And I think we really listen to it a bit. I listen a little bit more than Julian, I think. But we I think both of us keep an eye on what's happening and everything new because currently that's probably the most defining factor in culture, especially coming from the US, of course. Exactly, and I mean, it's it's just interesting. There's so many lessons in. Uh, 
in hip hop, whether people like even the music or not, but just the way that, you know, the way, I just think there's a ton of like amazing business lessons over there. One of our favorite one is the fact that people are always collaborating together on tracks. Um, another one is whether, you know, uh, this is probably like very famous by now, but for example, Kanye West, like he released an album, um, you know, which was, uh, which was just released, but then after a while, the titles, uh, I think changed or the orders of them changed. So it was kind of an album that was co-created with the audience, or at least uh, updated and, and, and reiterated with time. Uh, and I think th this is this is very clever. You know, traditionally people would work very 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 hard, create like one so-called perfect album and leave it there. But the fact that he came out, uh, you know, as a visionary and, and, and did all this like uh, this different take on on what an album can be and that it falls with time. That's also another. Um, great lesson and I think it ties to a point that you guys made earlier of like how perfect should something be before you ship it out I think Reid Hoffman said uh, that if, if something is, is, is too perfect you're probably like too late I, again I'm paraphrasing a little bit but really it, there, there, people should just put out their content put out their story put out their truth and it's gonna get better with time I would say and uh, my last question will be, I think, to kind of wrap the the show up is, what are the what are the plans for the next, let's say, five, six, seven, eight months of, of running the business and building it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now it's just about uh, making sure that we are able to, to honestly just add as much value as possible. We're trying to uh, participate with um, with a lot of communities where we believe there could be people that that could uh, hopefully benefit from this knowledge. And we just want to do as much free stuff as possible, as much give out as much free, valuable content as possible, because we feel that we honestly like just believe in, in it's a bit corny, but like we believe in like this abundance mindset where the more value you put out, the better it is for for everyone, because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So it's just a matter of how do we continue scaling the the content that we create, whether that's online or offline, by the way, but just how can we do uh, more and more and more of that? And, and hopefully build an ecosystem around it. I think that's a very, very good point. Uh, good, good, very good plan as well for somebody who's just starting out. Uh, Karim, thank you very much for being on the show. One last thing, it's an opportunity for you. You can ask uh, a question or just have an ask from our audience. Uh, we give you the floor if you have a question or something that you want people to do that is going to help you or uh, Tribe Tactics, uh, do it now. Survey time. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for for uh, for having me on the show. I really appreciated your time. I would say, um, it, you know, I don't even know what to say. I would say, whatever you're working on right now, if it is worthwhile, it's also worth sharing. And so, if that is the case, you should start documenting your journey the same way that you guys are doing. Um, by just creating daily documentaries. That's the easiest way to start creating content. It's completely free. It involves a camera, uh, not even the actual camera. You can use this simple like selfie camera and get started. But just share like a five minute summary of what you've done today and then do it again the next day or do it again the next week at least. Uh, just get into the habit of creating daily documentaries. That's how you'll be able to overcome, I guess, the, the fear of getting on video. I know I certainly had that when I started. And once, because once you have video, you'll be able to have a lot of power to create what else you want. So for me, it's not a question. It's just an, an ask, which is, you know, people should just start creating more video content and to start with what they have for free. Yeah. And I think also like the, the external benefits of that, uh, are a lot, but then there's a lot of, uh, like when we look at back, it's just fun, you know, to look back at like one year ago, two years ago, what happened, like what, what were we thinking back then, especially with the blog? Uh, it's it's funny how sometimes when you read it, it's like it wasn't you that wrote it because it was such a different you know mindset and. Mm, mm, I mean, that's it, interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting to look back, and I think even if uh, you know, if, let's say there's no business benefit to it, which there is, but just for personal reasons, I think it makes sense uh, to do that. Certainly, and and you never know because at the end of the day, the, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is you've created a lot of great content that maybe could be valuable for somebody in your network who's looking to go down a similar path. Exactly, exactly. And to wrap things up, any uh, handles, links, websites uh, that we can include in the show notes and also mention at the end of the show? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if, you know, if people go to, uh, so Tribe Tactics, you know, if they go to tribetactics.com uh, and they mention your show, we'll be happy to uh, 
to help them out uh, and give them a, a free piece of micro content uh, if you know we, we, you know to to get them started on on that journey of of really sharing their personal brand and sharing their story as they continue to build whatever they're building right now. Nice, we'll put that in the show notes. Cool. Cool. Karim, really appreciate your time. Best of luck uh, with the whole issue to your brother. And uh, if we're in Dublin, we'll definitely pop into the into the spell. Exactly. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you guys and uh, have a great evening. Yeah, take care. Gotcha. Have a, have a great evening Bye -bye. as well. For sure.